Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome to Three Shots of Espresso, a weekly podcast uh, every Thursday night. Uh, tonight, uh, inshallah, we will be looking at the, um, the, the, the topic of mental health, a very important and relevant topic right now uh, within our society, uh, something that hasn't been acknowledged for, for many, many years, but has been existing throughout time. Uh, but in uh, recent uh, years, has definitely gained a lot of attention uh, in popularity. And uh, tonight, with uh, Sunday being the uh, World Mental Health Day, the 10th of October uh, for the year 2021, we will be looking at the issue of uh, mental health with the intention of raising some awareness uh, regarding the issue. Uh, as a disclaimer, please note that what we are having is, a, uh, uh, is an awareness-based uh, discussion. This is not a substitute for professional help. Uh, should you need to uh, seek professional help, please do consult with a mental health professional of your choice um, and uh, take uh, matters uh, from there. Uh, we invite you uh, to join us in this discussion as we sub uh, unpack some issues regarding mental health. Uh, gentlemen, uh, Sheikh Zakaria uh, Matiani and Sheikh Abdullah Badat, welcome to Three Shots of Espresso uh, and our discussion on mental health. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah to yourself and uh, Sheikh Zakaria for having me on. I think it's going to be a fruitful discussion and I think it's uh, long overdue. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it such that uh, we derive benefit and for those who are suffering out there and need some clarity as well, uh, it provides us a, a, at least a stepping stone of, of guidance for them uh, from this podcast, inshallah. Inshallah, ameen. Uh, Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Abdullah, I believe you've done some uh, research uh, regarding mental health for your honours degree. Uh, generally, what has been your experience regarding mental health uh, issues within our community? I believe many people are experiencing you know, different type of mental health uh, struggles, whether they be stress, anxiety, uh, post-traumatic uh, stress disorder, uh, depression and the like. These are all part of, uh, and parcel of the human experience. Uh, and something that we shouldn't be ashamed of or shying away from. But unfortunately, within our communities, there's so much stigma uh, surrounding issues of mental health. Okay, uh, uh, in, my, in my small research, and I, I've always been passionate about uh, mental, uh, mental health issues in uh, Islam. Uh, that was basically uh, the research that I've done in my method and theory uh, module. And primarily I've done this because I've been approached by many people um, Throughout, I mean, I'm I'm ahead of of Islam at its school, so I, a lot of youngsters come to me and discuss certain things. And what I found from that was, they were very very reluctant to go and see a psychologist or a therapist or a counselor or, or or something like that. And what they would do is then come to myself and say, "Look, Morana, this is what I'm feeling. Sometimes I'm suicidal. Sometimes I'm I, I feel sad. I feel depressed. I don't mm. know why." And uh, what, what I used to do in the beginning stages was I used to start offering advice and, and then I realized, but you know, um, I'm not a professional in this field. You know, I could be doing more damage than actually helping out here. So what I, what I done was I went and sat with psychologists and counselors and, and I spoke to them. I said, look, how do we go about this and that? And then we came to find out, and I think it's quite clear amongst us, is um, there's a lot of stigma behind it. People do realize that they, they, they suffer from mental health issues, regardless whether it's depression, anxiety, whether it's schizo personality disorder, whether it's bipolar. They, they have this in them that, yes, I do have a problem. And yes, I need help for the problem. But I think the primarily and the, the biggest challenge that they have is what does what is the community going to say if I go to a psychologist or if I go for therapy? What, do I then become, I'm sorry to use it, but do I then become a nutcase? Do I then become a lunatic? Do I then become a mental case? And I think that this then motivated me then to open up and try to see where we can then create an, uh, you know, awareness around uh, mental health issues. I mean, even just what you are saying now, the stigma, uh, if, if we can give an example, initially when Corona came out, how many of them in the Muslim communities, people were scared to say that they have Corona? 
people were scared. <laughs> they were affected. You know, they had to beg people to come out and say that, you know, uh, initially it was like, you know, it's a disease where if you're going to say that, you know, I was affected, uh, it, it, it's equivalent to HIV or something like that, or it's something bad which, which, which happened to you. And people were just scared to speak out. So the stigma is there. Like you're saying about nutcase and, uh, uh, you know, um, anything, anything which has uh, those negative comments or, or, or people feel that, uh, you know, uh, they'll be looked down upon, uh, they, they, they're scared to open up about these, uh, so, you know, the, the, the issues that, are struggling, that they struggle with. I just wanted to add that when you were saying that, uh, you know, people would say that you are nutcase and it's the reality what's happening. Mm. No, that, that's Absolutely. correct, Mark. definitely. Uh, absolutely, but like on that, I mean, for example, we know that, I mean, with the amount of uh, the, the, the range of, of mental health issues that are out there, right? Uh, no two issues can be the same. No two people's experience of even one, let's say a similar diagnosis, a diagnosis or the same diagnosis by a professional, it should be done by a professional, uh, could be the same, you know? Um, yeah. Just like, for example, uh, you know, in preparation for, for this podcast, and this is an interest of mine, so reading into uh, Islamic psychology, Islamic psychotherapy, um, I spoke to some psychologists uh, and I asked them, you know, uh, how do you feel about, uh, about this in terms of our community? And one of them said, you know, just like you're going to go to a, a uh, let's say, a, a GP to treat a flu uh, or a cough or something of the sort, there's absolutely nothing wrong with checking in with a mental health professional, you know, regarding how you're feeling and, and how you're doing and, and the challenges uh, that you face, uh, you're facing in, in life. But unfortunately, uh, in a world that's basically uh, dominated by Instagram filters, likes and retweets, uh, everyone has to live a perfect little life. And uh, if there's any like cracks in the wall, uh, our entire existence uh, basically falls apart uh, because we're all supposed to be some, you know, some, some version of like, you know, uh, pretty and perfect, but uh, reality isn't like that. We are, uh, how can I say, flawed, uh, flawed beings uh, that are fragile. Uh, this is how God created us. And uh, as such, I mean, for example, seeking uh, the right amount of, uh, let's say, a treatment or the right types of treatment, starting off there, uh, there's absolutely nothing wrong. And I always, you know, uh, say, you know, what, why does somebody need to know whether I'm going to a psychologist or a counselor? Why does it need to be, uh, uh, you know, for example, branded uh, and, and um, displayed and advertised? You know, uh, it can be a very private and personal thing. Uh, why does somebody need to know that? But you see, uh, Brother Anwar, you see that the, the mm -hmm. I think, and uh, when I looked into this thing and I, and I thought about it, look, if you look at it from a logical point of view, right? Like if we just apply our logic and leave everything else aside, uh, it makes no sense for it to have stigma if, if you look mm -hmm. at it from a logical point of view, right? And why I right. say that, say for an example, you have a person who is a diabetic, right? And now this person is a diabetic. So uh, obviously, uh, if there's medical doctors or psychologists listening, and I hope that they comment on it because they could help us when we make mistakes. But just from a small understanding is that a lot of the times the pancreas in the body is responsible for releasing uh, insulin. So when that, when that function of the body doesn't work correctly, then obviously it needs to be substituted. So you have to take insulin. And people will not feel anything by going to a doctor and saying, look, I'm a diabetic. I need to be on my medication. In fact, before the medication gets done, they're waiting in a line at the pharmacy because they know the repercussions that if I do not take it, you know, my sugar could go high, could go low. I could end up in a coma. So if you look at it from a mental, even from mental issues, perhaps you might have a chemical imbalance and it's the same like you taking that insulin just to replace the body and to uh, bring mm. it, to, it to, to its levels. So you're taking something in just to basically balance your, 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 either it's your dopamine or whatever it is in the brain. So from a logical point of view, it shouldn't be a stigma. That's the one side. And mm. I think why it has become such a big thing and, and, and as a stigma, especially, and I have, to, I have to echo this, especially in the Muslim community. Uh, your geographic location is going to play a very big role in this. But in the Muslim community, it was it is more uh, linked to two things. And you could correct me if I'm wrong. Number one is when people suffer from a mental health issue, the very first thing that happens and people would say that they have a lack of Iman. Right. Mm. So that's the very first yeah, the Iman story. And, 
right. They, they have like, you know, like, brother, you're not reading enough salah, your wuzu is not correct. So I think you were a little bit uh, not okay upstairs, right? So that's the very first thing that I've noticed is that when this happens in a Muslim community, that, that that's the first thing they go to. Or the second thing, unfortunately, and it's a really big unfortunate, is that this person is suffering from jadu or a jinn, right? Mm. So like, even if you look at like schizophrenia is very, very close to jinn possession. And it's oftenly, I think it's mis mistaken for, for a jinn possession. So I think mm. that's where, where the problem actually stems from is not actually us recognizing that, that, that the normal thing to have a mental health issue, it's a normal thing like a person with hypertension. But I think the, the, the persona and the, the, the ripple effect that we've created around the entire idea of mental mm. health issues, I think that's why people are actually suffer in silence. I don't know if, if uh, that's making sense what I'm saying. Yeah, that is, that is uh, in fact, that is one of the things that I, I put up where it's, it's, it's also in the Muslim community and also amongst culture. Culture plays a big role, you know? Mm. So in, in culture of somebody with a mental illness, people will be like, hey, they did some black magic on him or he's possessed or, or, or something like that, uh, you know? Mm. And the other is obviously, <clears throat> like you said, and this is a big discussion amongst Muslim psychologists, uh, especially that uh, it's attributed to, you have a, you, you, you know, you, you, you're not reading enough Quran or you're not religious enough, or uh, you know, mm. you need to make more adhkar and, and not knowing that even Abu, uh, Abu Zaid al balkhi he broke up, um, uh, you, you know, he, he brought different types of, of, of uh, diagnosis for, for, uh, for, for, for mental health. So, for example, he said that uh, sometimes uh, some, uh, uh, you know, he broke it up. So he spoke about uh, endogenous and exogenous, which is endogenous is internal. So sometimes biological, uh, or sometimes you know a genetic um, mm -hmm. way you know you know these, these problems come and it's caused internally uh, you know by by, by some uh, you know, for for some reason or environmental or reactionary or something which happens like a, you're losing somebody that you love or whatever and then he mentions that for for the internal which is intrinsic he says for that uh, probably a person would need medication. And mm. then he said for the external, uh, probably a person would need talk therapy. And then, mm. but he said the optimal thing for, 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 for this person is that medication and talk therapy. So, yeah. so here you're seeing that even in today's time, this is the way it's done. And he's a ninth century scholar who was discussing this I mean, here. Just to interject, uh, 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 Zakaria, in fact, we, and I just don't know how far we actually drafted because in mental health uh, and, and, and OCD and all those things, Muslims were actually the pioneers of it because in Baghdad, already 70 years after Hijrah, we had the first mental health uh, clinic. And mm -hmm. it, it's just... You know, it's so Daru how, yeah, how, how, I mean, how, how we moved from, from, from there to where we are at the moment. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and so on the point, if I may, if I may come in here, gentlemen, you know, we're speaking about uh, Abu Zaid al balkhi We're speaking about uh, the institutions that we had in Baghdad. You know, almost uh, what within the seventh century, right? Um, we, I mean, Islam has had a very long uh, association with uh, treating basically mental health uh, disorders, right? So, for example, even uh, Abu Hamid al Ghazali, rahimullah, Imam al Ghazali, right? Uh, the great uh, faqih, the great uh, spiritual master. I mean, he acknowledges mental health issues. Uh, Abu Zaid al balkhi I mean, his theories, uh, you know, for example, are, are still relevant uh, today. Uh, so the Muslim contribution to this, uh, to this field was, was phenomenal. I mean, some of the, the research and readings uh, that we've been doing, and I mean, there's a, 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 someone that all three of us would be familiar with, is uh, Sheikha uh, Dr. Rania Awad, uh, currently based in uh, the, the, the States at uh, Stanford, uh, university, yes. right? Uh, an alima, a psychiatrist, uh, you know, PhD level uh, lecturer, and someone who's really, you know, reviving, uh, let's say, Muslim, uh, uh, Muslim interest in mental health issues. And, you know, with the, the research that she brings to the fore, like her and her teacher, Dr. Malik Badri, uh, along with people like uh, Dr. Abdullah Rothman, and, and there's quite a few others uh, as well, right? Dr. Showing Dunya. that, you know, yes show, show uh, showing uh, 
basically that we've had a long association uh, with this field. We've contributed to this field. There's nothing to be uh, ashamed about uh, and embarrassed about. Uh, and then we should be at the forefront again. And when people within our communities are experiencing, you know, basically the ups and downs of life, there is nothing wrong with basically taking uh, the proactive step, taking charge of the situation and sitting down uh, with basically a qualified professional uh, to, to, to work through your issues in whatever form of therapy uh, the, uh, the, the uh, professional has outlined uh, for you. And obviously that must be done by a, by, by a professional. But some of the things that uh, Muslims were involved in, one, you know, we talked about talk therapy, sitting in and talking with a counselor, something like how we would do today. We spoke about the idea of uh, medication, similar to how a psychiatrist would maybe treat the patient between a mixture of talk, uh, talk therapy and uh, medication. What's interesting also was that in our uh, Bemaristan or like, you know, these inst mental health institutions, firstly, they were not built on the outside of, of cities, you know, or like, let's say, uh, settlements. They were part and parcel of the city not to ostracize, uh, basically, people who were working through issues. And... Uh, the therapy was very holistic. So it was a mixture between, you know, Ibadah, Afkar, uh, sp uh, speaking with a, a medical professional who obviously ha held an Islamic worldview. They even looked at things like, let's say, music therapy. May sound controversial, but music does have an effect on the brain and on human emotions. They looked right. at issues like this here. Uh, but all we would say is that, you know, mashallah, so-and-so has low iman. Uh, they need to make more dhikr. Dhikr is beautiful, but they... Like you need to tie your camel and trust in Allah. Here you need to trust in Allah, what your dhikr, and also speak to your psycho psychologist or psychiatrist. You know, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> I just have to come in. I just appreciate the, 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 the point that you made. Is that, you know, uh, it's always affiliated. They just go and make a dhikr, you know. Mm, and yeah. when I spoke to my students about this thing uh, not too long ago, and they asked me what's my position uh, with regards to mental health issues in Islam. Uh, you know, and I, I had to break it down and say, you know what, the word mental health is too broad and the word Islam is too broad also. But just to give you, a, a, you know, just a, 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 a very simple analogy is that we will blame a person for being bipolar, right? And say your mm -hmm. iman is weak. Uh, we'll blame a person for being uh, whatever it is, OCD, postnatal depression, whatever it is you want to call it. Mm. Uh, and we say you have weak iman. Why don't we do the same with a hypertension patient? Or somebody else who has another issue say, look, brother, uh, I don't think you should be taking your hypertension medication. I think you should go home and read two rakat, Sarah, and leave it for one month. We'll make janaza for him, right? Because we know the repercussions of it. So I think that the one problem that we have is because you see, when you have when you have diabetes or something, it's something that is uh, you can you can measure it. You can say that your mm -hmm. pressure is so high because there's a measurement attached to it. So uh, people actually believe that, okay, we've we seen it, that my pressure is so high. Mm. We've seen that sugar levels. Are, it's unfortunate. It's very difficult to, to, to measure mental health issues. You, you can't measure what, what a person feels. You know, it's, 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 it's an abstract kind of a thing. Uh, and right. I think that's another issue where our, we, we, we try to then push it away because it's like we have this idea of, uh, you know, seeing is believing which that's actually contrary to our Islamic, uh, mm. uh, we thought that a lot of things that we don't, we don't know what we have to believe in. Uh, but mm. I think we have that idea that seeing is believing and because something can be weighed and it's concrete, uh, we take it more serious than something that is uh, abstract and obviously cannot be measured. But uh, there's one thing that really, that there's a hadith that always comes to my mind and there are many hadith out there, but I just thought I'll share it with them. Is that the Prophet Wasallam comes to the masjid on one occasion and uh, Abu Umama is sitting there. Now, this really hits me very hard when I see the Prophet as, awesome. there's, there's no, he's the, he's the most pious. We need to follow his guidance, you know. And he walks in and looks at Abu Umama and he says, but what's wrong? You know, you're looking very, very sad. And he says, you know, humumun lazamatni wa duyunun ya Rasulullah. He says, you know, I'm feeling anxiety and I'm being, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm basically enveloped in anxiety because I have this huge, this huge, uh, huge debt that I need to pay. Now the mm -hmm. Prophet did this time, Astaghfirullah, you know, Abu Umama, you feel anxious. I mean, you're feeling depressed. I think there's a problem with your Iman. No, the Prophet took him and said, okay, you know what, this is, I understand what's going on here. 
But let me give you something. And the Prophet gave, gives him that dua, you know, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-hammi wal-huzni wal-adzi wal-kasli, you know, the dua, ghalabati dayni wa qahri rijal. But the, when I see that approach of the Prophet wasalam, even to a mental health issue, to something which is abstract, so some anxiety, something which you cannot measure, and yet the Prophet wasalam, was so diplomatic, was so accommodating of it. I think it, it's, it's, it's really baffles me that we, we can't have the same tolerance uh, to a certain level. And, 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 and one of the things that, uh, that, 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 that I found amazing also is while reading through Abu Zaid Balkhi's, um, one of the things that he said, and this is amazing. So he breaks down this whole, uh, uh, you, you know, the, the, this whole understanding of, of, of mental illness. And he speaks about it as, um, uh, for example, internal. He speaks about it situational. He speaks about the social factors which contribute towards mental illness. Uh, he speaks about biology. So, so, and in today's time, obviously, um, for, uh, like Dr. Rania was saying, when he speaks about internal, it could be as biological. When he speaks about situational, it could be psychological. And when he speaks about social factors, it's social, the, the social uh, origins. But one of the amazing things which I saw he wrote was that then also, after mentioning all of this, he says there's an emergency kit for everybody because they, at a certain time, everybody goes into some type of, 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 of mental issue, whether it's depression, whether it's anxiety, whether it's sadness, everybody is, nobody is immune to going uh, into some type of, 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 of disorder. And he says the, the emergency kit, which he stresses on after mentioning all of this, and then he mentions, he says, is for a person to recite his day, to have a weird, and a weird year means to have a system in your life of certain recitations which you recite daily. Because he says- And du'as. And du'as, you know, especially, and, and one, of the, one of the things that I always encourage also, uh, uh, and, and this is something which I also uh, would love to fully implement in myself. And you see this, what, what, what uh, the, 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 the Habaib, the scholars of Yemen and that, the close connection with adhkar, with, with, with du'as, uh, with prayers that you recite after fajr. And they have so much of meaning in them, like just the one, Bismillah alladhi la yadurru ma'asmihi shay'un fil ardi wa la fis sama. You know, in the name of Allah, uh, uh, nothing can harm you except uh, uh, when you take the name of Allah, nothing can harm you. Uh, you know, and he's the, 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 the greatest, you know, so the meaning of these uh, du'as that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has taught us, Abu Zaid al balkhi says that when a person, in, whether it's during the day or whatever, and he's about to internally or externally experience some type of anxiety or something, these emergency of car will then kick in and almost stabilize him and, and, and be of assistance. So he's saying that that is also a solution, but then he speaks of these other symptoms also and says that, you know, so carry on with your adhkar, but there is medication also that needs to be taken. There is talk therapy that needs to be done. There is somebody that you need to go and discuss your issues with. It's not only that it is uh, matters of, of, of spirituality or reciting Quran or making dua. So even, you know, it, this, is, this is something which we need to realize. And in fact, on Facebook, when I, when I posted the, 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 uh, the, the the program. Um, I hope one of our. I hope the view. The, 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 one of the, is a, 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 one of the. And this is good. We you know we discuss and 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 one of the things he mentioned was that you know suicide, for example, uh, mm. is very low amongst the Muslim because um, Muslims know it's forbidden. And I said this is the reason why we need to discuss these issues because many people think that you no, know, because I'm Muslim, you know, we immune to. To, to all of this, but yet in the Muslim community, suicide is, is, is it, it's happening. It's real. Yeah, it's absolutely. real. But on, but on that point, we, because of the, uh, obviously, the, the forbiddenness of suicide, something being haram, right? So it's obviously something that people, uh, let's say, serve a family of, of a person that commits suicide, friends and so forth, right? We all will be ashamed of it, right? Uh, so it's something that we try to cover and we try to hide. Yes, right. Uh, it is haram. Haram. There is no justification for uh, for it. Our lives are not our own. They belong to Allah. We belong to Allah. There is no there is no discussion about that. 
but the fact is that people in our community, one, are having suicidal thoughts, right? Uh, two, they may, uh, let's say, be attempt uh, cases of attempted suicide, right? A case of attempted suicide was basically the suicide, uh, basically the attempt doesn't work out. Most of the time, it's what? A cry for help, right? And then sometimes, unfortunately, well, unfortunately, very unfortunately, the people are successful in their attempts, right? Uh, and when it happens, then afterwards, you know, there's this, oh my God, if only we knew this person was going through this, then why didn't he talk? Why, do, why didn't he talk? Why didn't she talk? You know, uh, why doesn't someone have to be parasuicidal uh, before we can wake up and say, you know what, we need to change our approach as a community uh, on an individual, family and, and com communal level towards such a, a, a crucial issue. So I really like to like hear your guys' thoughts about how, let's say, because all three of us do engage uh, community in different ways, uh, basically as students of uh, uh, the prophetic tradition, Islamic studies, right? What should be our attitude when uh, basically people come to us and they open up, you know, I'm facing X, Y, and, and, and Z. What do you guys think should be, like, let's say the appropriate, responsible way of engaging when they open up to us about uh, such, such issues? I think so. Like, I mean, and then I'll give it over to 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 Malana okay. Badat to, to to stress on. And I think so. One of the important is when we were doing counseling, and I, and then you can elaborate on this, Malana. That one of the things that when we were doing counseling, the advice that was given is if you don't know about something or you're not sure about the issue, even if you're an imam, you know, even if you you know uh, you know you know your uh, Quran and your hadith and you know you did usul and all of this stuff but if you're not familiar with the topics if you're not familiar with what this person is going through and sometimes you know um, like Mulana was saying earlier that advice is not just enough um, you need to know when to give advice and you need to know when to draw the line and say that look um, let me somebody else and there's many times where uh, where cases come to myself also at the masjid and I realize that, you know what, I need to draw the line here and I'll, I'll say, brother, you know what, or sister, let me find out, let me see what, what can be done about this year or who to contact and I'll get back to you. There's nothing wrong in, in, in you not answering every issue that comes to you. And especially I'm just saying this as from a scholar point of view uh, or an imam or, or a person who's dealing with the community, make sure that when somebody comes with these type of, uh, especially if somebody is saying they're contemplating suicide, uh, or somebody is saying that you know they 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 constantly, um, you know they constantly feeling like uh, they just want to take uh, just want to take their life. It's important for you to really understand uh, your steps that you're going to take in terms of understanding where this person is coming from. So I would say that really um, educate yourself in this topic. And if you're not well educated in it, then know where to draw the line in terms of dealing with, with people with these issues. Sir Zakaria, I really, um, I, I second you on that 100%. Uh, in my experience, what I've, I, I've learned is uh, when these people or, or somebody with a mental health issue or having suicidal thoughts or uh, whatever the case may be, sometimes we don't know exactly what the problem is. They don't want to be told you know, uh, don't worry, don't be sad, uh, don't cry. They don't want to be told these things because they, they, that's the way they feel. And I found that the easiest way just to calm them in the, in, the, in the initial stages is to just sit, listen, regardless of what they say, regardless of how funny it sounds to you or how stupid it sounds to you or uh, to you it looks like a small problem. Well, that's a small problem for you. For him, it's a major issue, right? Hmm. And just tell me more. That's all that I say. Tell me more. Because now they feel that, okay, somebody is actually listening. A lot of people think I'm talking nonsense, but this person actually is asking me to tell them more. And the best mm -hmm. advice you then can give a person after this, and I promise you, is to tell them to get professional help. Because myself, if you ask me about Quran and you ask me about Hadith, I will feel comfortable to sit and say, okay, let's discuss. But if you're going to ask me about mental health issues and all these things, it's not my profession. Look, I'm passionate about it. Yes. I read a lot about it. Yes. Am I licensed, uh, a licensed uh, psychologist? No. Am I a licensed GP? 
No, that's not my jurisdiction. I can advise you and the best advice I can give you is look, I need you to go and seek professional help. And I think as, as ulama, as, as, as people, we have to have a psychologist on speed dial where we can refer and look, you have a psychologist, uh, you know, you're working in a community, you know that you have issues and a lot of those issues are also going to be mental health issues. So you need to have somebody who's willing to work with you as well as a community because sometimes the people come to you first, they don't go to a psychologist. They come to you and on your referral, they're like, oh, Monana said I should go. And then they take the step. And I mean, it's, 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 it's more about just letting people become aware of it because there's so many homes that people will love for 20, 30 years. They love their entire lives uh, in this sad state and in this uh, broken state because of, of the stigma behind it. Uh, people will then, I mean, there's, there's husbands who will beat their wives up and conveniently just say, no, at that moment I was possessed by a jinn. And then she has to just say, okay, you know, let, let's, for, let, let's forego those things. It's like a loophole for, for he, to vent his anger or his issues that he has. Uh, I mean, the, the main thing is I, I hope that people and I hope the Muslim community can, can wake up before it's too late. I think that, mm -hmm. like uh, Anwar mentioned before, like people are suicidal. Have we not contributed to that? I mean, we, we are mm. equally guilty because we have com contributed to that. People don't want to go and see mental. They don't want to go there because of what we have put out to them, you know? And, and I mean, there's an entire year in the in the in history of, 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 of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam known as so, Amul Hassan. The year of sadness. I mean, sadness is something, again, I'm saying it's abstract. It's not something concrete. But it, there's, there's a notion that there's an idea behind that. I mean, and you go into the history of, of the Anbiya, Yaqub alayhi salam, aynahu min al -husni. Mm. I mean, he became blind because of sadness. And yet Allah quotes him in the Quran and Allah doesn't rebuke him for, for, for that because it's an emotion. I've been separated from my son. The same with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. When no, son Ibrahim passed away, he started crying. Sahaba said, wa anta ya Rasulallah. You also, Prophet you're crying. He says, al tadma' the eyes will surely tear. And the heart will feel pain. The heart will feel the sadness. But we shouldn't say things except that is uh, pleasing to our Allah. So I think, uh, like, like we're having this podcast, Alhamdulillah, I, I hope that it will, it will open up for many other people. But I think that it has to be more vocal. We have to get ulama to prepare good uh, lectures on it on, on a Friday, Juma as well. So when they're speaking to people on Juma, you never know. There could be a thirty percent of, of people in that in that in, in that masjid that has uh, mental health issues. And coming from a leader of the community, they could say, "Ah, oh, we thought this team was wrong all the years." And you could be helping those people silently. They might not come and take mm -hmm. your hand and shake your hand and say, "You, uh, you know, you help me." But you 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 might have opened something for the next person. Mm -hmm. So I think I think it's it's just about this awareness really. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, that, that, that. Before you go on, um, just mentioning when you said I was reading and um, uh, one of the things that I came across that on when his eyes became white from this was not because of um, uh, the, 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 this, this, this was because when they gave him the, uh, the, the, the news of Binyamin he actually, this was because he started thinking of Yusuf. And yet they're giving him the news of Binyamin. So it was right. an external, some, something else, which increased the, the you, you, know, you know, the sadness. Existing pain and trauma. Existing yeah, pain and trauma. And that's why Allah, yes, and that's why Allah uses the two words, you know, innama ashku bathi wa huzni Allah. You know, they both mean sadness, but one is like an old sadness and the other one is now, I, I could maybe interpret it to mean like, you know, when you have post-traumatic stress, something new happens and an old incident is now revived, that old wound is actually scratched. It's triggered. Over. You and, know, it's triggered and, again. And then, Mulana, the second point you mentioned and then Anwar can take over. Um, you know, it's such a, mashallah, it's such a, a topic, subhanAllah. When you were saying that, um, just listening, in fact, last week, um, I had a beautiful couple uh, come to me and, 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 and one of them had extremely, extremely um, horrible experiences as, as, as a child, which, which was now, you know, overtaking this person's, uh, you know, and um, some of the things were really extreme. And I was just listening 
And I said to them, you know what, as a scholar, this is not, I, I'm not going to, I'm going to, I'm going to recommend that you do some type of, get some type of psychological help because it's very important that you'll do this. SubhanAllah, this morning, the spouse phoned me and said, Mulana, we're going for our first session. Please make dua. And this, this is what you say. This, 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 you're not there to always advise. And sometimes you could contribute unknowingly, you know. So sometimes just there to listen. And this is the important part that you mentioned, Mulana, that sometimes as scholars, we need to know where to just listen and see and have a, maybe a psychologist on speed dial or somebody that we can discuss to or supervisor and, and, and you know, deal with these matters and make sure that we are there to be a pillar for our community and guide them. And sometimes if we can't be that pillar, at least we can be the direction towards where they could find uh, assistance, you know, that's very important. I, I love how you put it. Um, you know, the both of you, the idea that like, let's say for example, one, uh, you know, speaking from our perspective as, as, as students, uh, basically of Islamic sciences, uh, working with our communities. One is that from the member and the different platforms that we have, let's talk about this issue. Let's remove the stigma, right? Two is that we can't solve everyone's problems, but we are going to point in the direction of people that should be better equipped, professional people that should be able to do this. For the Muslim community, the Muslim community needs to keep in mind is that we have an entire civilizational tradition. Part of that civilizational tradition of Islam was basically uh, working with mental health issues. Uh, we don't only have to resort to basically a Western secular approach towards dealing with uh, uh, mental health, right? And right now we, we're going through a revival uh, of like, let's say, uh, Islamic mental health uh, uh, therapy. And it's a beautiful thing to see because this is something part and parcel of our civilization, uh, our body of knowledge that was maybe, let's say, lost and swept under the carpet for a while. So it's beautiful to see it all being uh, revived. And uh, I feel that, you know, I always make dua for the people that, that are involved in this kind of work, reviving uh, this part of knowledge. But when we speak to our communities, when we speak to our family and our friends, uh, friends about it, I think when we make it normal, trying to remove the stigma, uh, we're also going to face some challenges seeing the way how people are programmed because we program to, you know, that if somebody says, I think you need to see a psychologist or a counselor uh, or, or, you know, uh, or, or psychiatrist, oh yeah, you think I'm nuts, you think, uh, you know, yeah, I'm using the words, you think I'm mad, uh, I'm incapable as a human being, right? Uh, you know, that we, in one uh, uh, statement, but just by one recommendation, coming from a place of con concern uh, and, and, you know, of, of deep mercy, that we writing off the person's entire existence. That's not the case, you know? And it's unfortunate sometimes that even highly education, uh, educated people, when they're given the best of advice, they don't respond well. But then there's people also who, you know, respond very well to it because they see that it's coming from a place of goodness. I'll give you an example. Uh, there's somebody I know, a very high uh, performing individual, right? Uh, you know, just going through life experiences, uh, experienced uh, some, uh, some challenges, uh, but they were proactive. They were willing to recognize that, you know, whatever they're experiencing is not just, you know, like, let's say, uh, something that their GP can solve, that they, they are, they, they are possibly uh, deep, uh, deeper issues. So when they were uh, advised, you know, maybe just take a try, go have a, a chat with a psychologist, you know, a little friendly half an hour chat, right? Uh, over a period, let's say, in that one session, uh, is the, the, uh, let's say uh, the session played out, uh, they, they unearthed certain issues and they realized, you know, we need to take uh, this more seriously. They ended up seeing a psychologist, but because they were so, uh, I can say, committed to the process very, very sincerely, within a short period of time, uh, their anxiety issues were pretty much, I would say, uh, resolved uh, and, and they're back on track, you know? Uh, and I've had other experiences uh, like that with people who took, you know, the proactive step to say, you know what, uh, there is something here, there's something troubling me. Uh, I can't be uh, running, uh, running around uh, in my mind every night, missing sleep, unable to eat, unable to function, uh, unable to interact with the rest of society. I need to do something about this uh, as, uh, let's say, as a, uh, uh, someone uh, aspiring to live a productive and good life. And those who took the steps 
Uh, I think some of them have made some good progress. I think you guys have had experience with that as well. Uh, so there's absolutely nothing wrong. The more we speak about it, the more we can re uh, remove stigma. In the last five minutes of our discussion, unfortunately, I feel that a lot of men, uh, we as men, we have this, you know, this macho atti attitude that uh, men don't cry, uh, men uh, uh, don't need to speak to anyone. We can carry the world's uh, problems on our shoulders without breaking a sweat. Uh, and as such, we actually are falling uh, victim to huge mental health issues. I was, I was looking, <laughs> I found something very funny which uh, Dr. Jordan Peterson said which, <laughs> about, about, about men. <laughs> and he mentioned this, and it just came to my mind that this whole stereotype of, of men, you know, the, the macho men and, 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 you know, this. And one of the things he said is also that uh, really affects men to think in this way is um, when, we, uh, when men compare them or try to impress uh you know the, the females or, or, or when men compares himself to 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 the feminine and 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 this is obviously not looking down upon them but uh, many a times i don't know if you <laughs> i always use this uh, example for example we can be playing a nice soccer game everybody is just enjoying a soccer game and 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 one uh, uh if one, let's say if, if one female comes or whatever and just sits and starts watching the soccer game and then everybody wants to dribble, everybody wants to show that they skillful and do funny stuff. And he even mentioned that sometimes you find like a young boy uh, who if, if he sees a female that he likes would even risk his life, for example, like walk on a fence or walk on a wall and show that, you know, he can balance or, or, or show his uh, you, you know, his, his strength or whatever. And you see it also spinning cars and speeding with cars and all of this. So this has made men to believe that, uh, you know, you always have to show your, your like, you're the man. You always have to show that, you know what, I'm, nothing can affect me, you know? And there's this one comedy that I, I, I saw, um, comedy, co comedic scene that I saw where uh, this guy, uh, there are a few gangsters who are getting together for a meeting. And when they all sit down, there's no more chairs left and just one gangster now is left standing. And he just stands like this here and they, they, the, the, the lead of the gangster says to the other, get him a chair and he's like, no, no, don't worry, I'll just stand over here. So they say, but you can sit down, you know? He's like, no, 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 I'll just stand. I don't need to sit down. And now he's trying to show his manhood. So I think so this is also, it contributes towards um, how we think a man should be. And, and, and this is the problem that we find. I remember that when we uh, opened up the, the, the men's counseling at the Jamia, um, this was one of the things that we were trying to get for men. You know, men do, for example, men do cry. You know, men mm -hmm. do speak about their issues and problems, uh, you know, and, and you're not a weak uh, a man to, 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 to go through any of these issues. And I, I think so we need to make this palatable and we need to make it uh, something which is normal for a man to speak about some of the things that he is, is that, that he's going through or uh, some of the issues that he's going through, you know? So uh, th this is this is from, from my side, I think so uh, we need to work towards, even if it's the, uh, you know, using the platform of, of Juma or, or the, using the member as a platform, using, um, uh, giving the Prophet Sallallahu himself as, 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 as a person who, look at the Prophet, for example, uh, you know, he also went through, um, uh, he also went through, uh, you know, the sadness and, 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 and he also went through this, yet he was, I mean, he held his son, the Sahaba, literally, I mean, the Sahaba in their minds before they asked him, Wa ya Rasulullah, which means that they also thought that men don't cry, <laughs> you know, that mm. they have to be the strong uh, individual and when they saw the Prophet Sallallahu crying uh, you know Imam Qurtubi says min al -husni. the min is, 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 is pointing that from sadness this whole verse that his eyes became white literally only because of sadness that uh, he, you know so so uh, it shows that um, uh, you, you know men do have a, a, a soft side and, and, a, and a fragile side and, 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 and you need to, if you're going through these problems, there's nothing wrong as a man to speak with other men or to go and see somebody 
that is qualified in the field and discuss this issue. Definitely, Mr. Zakaria, very, very well said. And uh, just on a light, just on a light note, you know, we're speaking about how men show off and <laughs> try to be the macho men. You know, the brain is a very, very powerful tool, very, very powerful. From the day you're born until the day you die, it doesn't stop working, except for two occasions. When a man is in love or is about to take an exam, then the brain fails to work, right? <laughs> but but uh, that's just besides the point. You know, it's uh, it's just. Uh, I'll end off on, on on this note: is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is in a cave of Hira. He sees Jibril Alayhi Salam for the first time. He's asked to read Iqra, and he responds, "Ma ana biqarin," and it, it comes in, in the narration of Al uh, uh, Sahih Al Bukhari. And then he says, Faghattani, Jibril grabbed me and he squeezed me, Hatta balaghaniya minhul judda, until I almost passed out. Now, after this entire incident, he's the strongest of men, he's Imamul Anbiya, he's the leader of the, of the, of the Anbiya, he is the most beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Where does he go to? He goes to his wife Khadija Kubra, he's shivering, he's worried. He's anxious and he tells her, Zammiluni, Dathiruni. He's a man that he goes to Khadija al Kubra. And this made the Prophet a man. A man is not a guy who can walk around and show his macho-ness. I believe if a man has an issue and he can own up to it and say, I want to be a better man because I have this issue and I get that, that help, that is a true man. Because awesome. manhood is not just me and what I can do, and who I can push around. You're not strong if you can do that. Because I, I believe the biggest challenges and the biggest fears that we have is within our own selves. And once we can conquer those things, then we can help others here. If we cannot conquer ourselves, and uh, you know, Allah asks you this question, mm. within yourselves, don't you ponder? And that uh, sometimes we don't have that self-reflection. That and, and we feel that we are men, but I ask so many of my friends and I ask so many of my students, tell me who you are without your degree, without your family name, without your money, without your cell phone, nothing. Who are you? And tell it to me in less than 10 words. If you cannot do that, you haven't figured yourself out. So uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us understanding. I thank you guys for having me on here tonight. And it was really, really good chatting with you, uh, Brother Anwar and Sheikh Zakaria Yani. It was really awesome. I hope this goes far. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take us all from strength to strength. Well, Anwar, you got the last three minutes. I mean, uh, shukran uh, so much. Uh, that was very, very, very well said. Um, all I would like to say in conclusion, uh, firstly, thank you to you both. Uh, this was an exciting discussion. Lots to unpack. It's one that we need to continue to unpack. Uh, for whoever was watched, watching, listening, or well watch, well listen, uh, please do remember this is not a substitute for seeing a professional, for uh, consulting with professional help. It's not a substitute. Uh, for you being a more compassionate and reasonable human being when uh, others come to you and they open up about different challenges uh, that they face it. Uh, you know, please be responsible. Uh, we will post along with uh, when we do upload this video. Naturally, we do like, you know, to recommend things for further reading, for further watching, for further listening. Uh, so we will post uh, certain links uh, to things, uh, you know, to unpack this, uh, this issue further. Um, and let's remove the stigma as a community. And uh, just like how flus and sugar diabetes, we use that example quite often in uh, tonight's chat, right? Have become common and we deal with it in a common way and we don't stigmatize people who are facing different challenges. We can deal with them in the same way because ultimately all of us in life will face different uh, mental health issues at some time or the other. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that while we trust in him, uh, we also take the necessary steps. Shukran Jazeelan. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.